الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستحده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله With Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. All praise belongs to Allah, the guardian, evolver, cherisher, sustainer of all the realms of knowledge. We praise him, we seek his guidance, we seek his assistance, and we seek his forgiveness, and we believe in him. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our own selves. and we seek refuge from Allah from the evil consequences of our actions of our deeds and we openly bear witness that there's nothing worthy of worship except Allah that he is alone and without partners and we openly bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah to whom the Quran was revealed is his servant and his messenger and prayers of peace be upon him We'd like to thank Allah for giving us another great opportunity to worship him to make it through this uh, week to be back to Salatul Juma. We thank we ask that he strengthen us, purify us, inspire us, motivate us and protect us on Siratul Mustaqim. And today uh I'd like for us to reflect on something happening now in the world. technology as technology is changing and there's this new term which is gaining prominence uh you may hear it uh every so often people are talking about something called the internet of things so i'd like for us to reflect on technology and reflect on what this means this internet of things from a faith perspective and reflect on it through the prism of taqwa so <clears throat> so in the Quran uh Allah says I'm going to read the translation of surah known as the earthquake Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim When the earth is shaken to her utmost convulsion and the earth throws up her burdens from within and man cries distressed what is the matter with her on that day will she declare her tidings for that thy lord will have given her inspiration on that day will men proceed in groups sorted out to be shown the deeds that they have done then shall anyone who has done an atom's weight of good see it and anyone who has done an atom's weight of evil shall see it and surely Allah speaks the most magnificent truth so there's an explanation of some of this uh surah some of this this chapter in the Quran by our prophet uh Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam where it's reported that he said that he read one of the 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 verses from that surah the one that says on that day it will disclose its news or declare its tidings it's another translation and so the prophet asked to those around him do you know what what its news is and then he later he continued and he said verily its news is that it will bear witness against every servant male and female as to what he or she did upon its back I mean the back of of the earth by saying he did upon me such and such action on such and such day and so this is the the prophet explaining first of all this gives us an example that uh that the prophet's pattern right was to explain the Quran was to teach the Quran right was to reflect not only just 
have a, 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 a verse, but to think about how does that verse apply to how we, we should be thinking, right? So with that, I want to share a, a small story. It's actually a true story. So there were two skiers, an atheist and a believer in God. I know it sounds like a joke, but it's not a joke. Two skiers. And a, and a believer, and a, and a Muslim person who, who believes in God, they go skiing. Two women, actually. And they're on their they're skiing, and then they actually stop at one point, and they're admiring because they come to this point where they come to this great landscape, right? And they're, they're both looking at the view, the horizon, and they're seeing the mountain, they're seeing the sky, just the beauty, the pristine, just the beauty and the grandeur of nature. And the believer in God says, and they both know about each other's faith and how they think, right? So the believer in God says, wow, just look at this. You, if, how can you look at this and not think of your creator, not think of God? And they're both friends, right? So it's not antagonistic. And the atheist says, I don't think of God when I see this. And then the other one asks, well, what do, you, what do you think of? And the atheist says, I think of what I see, nature. That's it. And that's the, that's the story. That's the anecdote. And that little anecdote shows that we can have two people or two personas seeing the same circumstances, right? But they can relate to them differently, have a different orientation, have different uh, perspectives. Why? Why do those two people see this same view and draw different conclusions? Because they have different reference points and they have different assumptions. So what are, what are us? We're, what, is, what are our reference points, right? So as, as believers, our reference points, right, we believe, you know, we believe in, in Allah, right? And our reference point is the Quran, right? God's revelation to the human being, to humanity. And Prophet Muhammad as the pattern for us to follow. So th these two reference points sort of help us, you know, orient ourselves when we're looking at things in the world, whether it's nature, whether it's events, this is the foundation for how we form our, uh, our opinions, our conduct, our activities. So we also know that, what is the, so what is the, Quran, the Quranic reference point? The Quran is often telling us about reflecting. And not only just reflecting on nature, but that when we see what's in the world, it should point us to him. And it's whether it's good or bad, right? Because if we're reflecting on the beauty, the grandeur of the universe, we think about him, okay? If we, see, if we see calamity, if we see bad things happening, right? It has us reflect on him, maybe in a different way, but still the same orientation is, it has us think about what his role is, what he thinks about our role in connection to him. So this physical experience, it points us not just to uh, what is physically there, but it points us to a certain consciousness and a certain conduct. And if your mind is fed with this sort of reference, or these sorts of references, you draw different conclusions. So, for the believer in God, the majesty, it inspires, it should inspire a sense of taqwa, regardfulness towards God. And think about this, right? Because Muslims already, we know in, in our ritual practice, we have rituals that give us certain orientation, right? When we are praying, our orientation is in a certain direction. We have a certain qibla. All of that should give us a sense that we have a certain orientation, a certain direction. So when we're seeing all these things happening, different developments, right? The qibla never changes. If you're in Washington, D.C., the qibla is this way, right? If you're in uh, Denmark, your Qibla, right, it's not going to be, uh, it's, it's, uh, you're going to be in a different location, but the, your orientation is to the same point, no matter where you are in the world. So it's a, it, there's something there, right, that, 
as, as people of faith, people who believe that, that we have this singular orientation that we have no matter what circumstance we're in. And I'm not going to <clears throat> say that actually you can't come to some conclusions uh, uh, even uh, not being a believer, right? I mean, obviously an atheist could look at this and could feel awe, could be inspired as well, right? Obviously you see this nature. You, may, uh, uh, you might not believe in God, but you may feel humble because of how grand the universe is. So it's not to say that... that uh, you need to have faith to see, to have this sense of wonder when you reflect. But what is the missing link or what is the, 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 the component that completes it is that sense of taqwa for God. That sense of God, I don't even want to say in the equation, but, but the orientation is not just, okay, I'm humble because the nature is great, but I'm, I, I feel this sense of humility and there's something that is beyond this that I relate to, that I can't encapsulate, that can't be encapsulated in the physical world. So this is what drives this idea of taqwa, of regardfulness, because then your actions are not just sort of just individually, individually what you sort of thought about um, uh, from your own reasoning, you know, own reasoning alone, but it's from the sense of a divine guidance. So then we might ask, so why, perhaps, even with all these great signs, why, are, why may some folks be so easy to think, to not come to the same conclusion, right? They see the grant, they see these things. Why, is it, why does it seem, it seem it's so easy for people to reject the idea of God's role behind all of this, or to have an orientation? And we might say, or I might say that one of the key problems is they have a small idea of, of, of God. They have a small idea of, of what it means to relate to God. So sometimes if they're seeing, if there's corruption in the world, well, that corruption, if you don't have the sort of right filter, right orientation, that corruption it might be a sign to some folks that, is there a God? How could there be a God with all this bad stuff going in, on in the world? Where well, there's religious people who are, bigot, you know, who are bigots and who are, are, are murderers and do evil things. Oh, that, that, how could God? That doesn't seem like God would be associated with that, right? But what's the difference? See, the, the Quran doesn't do that. The, the Quran elevates God, elevates uh, the, 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 um, the understanding of Allah to be beyond all of that. So it's important as we're approaching life that we really remember the meaning of the term Allahu Akbar, right? What does that mean? God is bigger. God is bigger. So that relates to any situation. You're seeing corruption in the world. You're seeing a havoc. You're seeing calamities happen that may make the person that has a small view of God maybe think that, 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 that God is, 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 you know, for, yeah, is, is not present, is not there, is not a part of this. But if we know that God is bigger, anything that is happening, we realize God is even over that. So it's with this backdrop that we can talk about the Internet of Things. And we can talk about technology and where the world is going, where society is going. Before we get into that, another reference point for us, right? A historical reference point that we should think about when we think about the Quran, the prophet, his companions, and then what followed after him, right? We all know in this, in this, in this, uh, in this room today that in the successive, uh, in the subsequent generations after Muhammad passed, peace be upon him, that within centuries, and then the centuries that followed, that there was a scientific revolution that happened around the world. We all know this. It's historically documented. It's well understood. In fact, I heard, I, I forget, I can't remember the, the quote, but um, I think I heard recently someone said there was a, a non-Muslim uh, Muslim author who said, if the Nobel Prize were, uh, were given a thousand years ago, all of the recipients, for the most part, probably would have been Muslim. 
right? The Nobel Prize for Science. If you just think about it, if, if, that, if, we, if we had a Nobel Prize, and I don't mean just for peace, I'm talking for science, for all the different you know, uh, think categories. A thousand years ago, if we had the same sort of uh, evaluation or criteria, then most of the recipients probably would have been Muslim in terms of the advancements that were happening in society. So we know that you had, at that time, you had generations of Muslims who were intellectually curious, who were scientifically curious, and you had this environment where faith, right, was coupled with technology, with advancement. This was happening. This was, was, was going on in the world. So how can we consider that as we look at technology today? And how are we oriented towards it? So, the big idea that helped the earlier generations who did have all these scientific advancements, uh, Muslims that were having all these scientific advancements, they saw, they understood oneness. They understood Tawheed. Right? Because for you to go from understanding nature to then crafting something or creating something, Right? You have to be able to see the connections. So, Tawheed, which oneness, which is really the, the principal message of the Quran, right? The principal message of the Quran, right, is that Allah is one. And then all of our orientation, like we mentioned the Qibla, right? When you, if you're on Hajj, when you're praying, when we're going to pray here in 20 so minutes, right? We're all, all of humanity. We're aligned as human beings, connected. To, to, to one focus, which is Allah, and prostrating towards Him. So, the perspective, the reference point, is that God is one, and there is oneness within, uh, there, and that oneness is going to be um, uh, uh, understood, right? Or that oneness is going to be, um, uh, 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 will reverberate throughout creation. All of creation will reflect Allah's oneness. So, what is the Internet of Things? So, a, a basic, simple definition is, the Internet of Things is this phenomenon that we're seeing happening before our eyes, where all devices are connected to each other. Everyday devices. And they're sharing data. They're sharing information. That's what they call the Internet of Things. So some, some practical examples. You know, you have your phone. And there are, so many, there are advancements today. So where your phone, uh, if you have a certain device at your home, you could be here at the masjid, look on your phone, and there are devices where you can see if your door has been opened. There, there is a product that, where you can set up locks, right? Locks on the doors. Right, there's a company called August. And you don't even use these physical keys anymore. You don't need a physical key. On your phone, you just press a button and the doors unlock or lock. But the other part of it is when you're at your job, on your computer, you can get in, check your account. Now, this is not a commercial for any one product, but I'm just, <laughs> it's just fascinating. You can see... Who's go who unlocked the door at home? So your, your child just got home from school. Okay, boop, you see that they, they, they're there. They have other things. I mean, we all know, you know, nanny cams. There's a different levels where then you can have something in your home and it's monitoring not only who comes in, but is there movement? And if there's movement in the room, it will record it. You have a camera that records the movement. So that's for safety. So it doesn't just tell you, okay, someone broke in, but then if, they, if there's a motion sensor, if there's motion in the room, the camera goes on, right? There is biking. I got here to the master today on the Capital Bike Share. I don't know if you all, you all are familiar with it, right? Capital Bike Share is where these bikes, you can rent them throughout the city. You put in a key, and you can take one bike, and then you can drive or ride across the city, and you, you, block, you lock it, you park your bike, and then you go into, your, go into work, right? And so all I do is I put in the key, put in this key, then I get the bike, and then I just return the bike. So I don't need my own bike. I don't have a bike. Just yesterday I was looking. I, I had some issue with my, my account. And I went online, and I saw the, on the website, I joined, I got my key in, in late 2012, and it said that I have biked 466 miles since I got this key. 
And if I had probed further, it probably it would have told me where I had biked, how many times. I mean, this is amazing. And it also, I mean, we don't need to go into details, but it, if you were tracking your calories, it could tell you how many calories you, you had been burning. You know, I mean, it, all this stuff it had derived. So there's so many things, right? And all of this, there's so, there are some very interesting applications that are going to change how we're living and can even uh, impact morality. And it's not all, a lot of times, of course, what, what do we think when we think about these things? We think about the negative side. And I'll, I'll talk about why we think that way. But let's, let's think about some, a very real case. In insurance, so you know in, your, in homes, or even in cars, right? They're creating self-driving cars now. And a lot of us, you know, we hear that and it sounds like so far-fetched, so science fiction, but I'm telling you, from looking at the technological, not just the advancements, but the fact that this technology can save lives. I mean, it's going to happen. There, you know, people are predicting, of course, only Allah knows. So nothing that I say here is a prediction, because I don't know. But when you look at the benefit from deploying self-driving cars, yeah, it may take 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but if you think about how that would save in cost, so you know how much trouble it is trying to park here in D.C.? If you have self-driving cars, you don't have to worry about parking. It takes you to your destination, you get out, and then it goes to parks maybe a mile away. The parking, the parking lot industry, I'm saying, they're not going to be happy about that. But think about the saving. Think about the safety issues, self-driving cars. Think about now when you have to make a decision, oh, should I drive all the way to New York, or should I drive all the way to Boston, or should I take a flight? Self-driving car, you go at night, sleep the whole way. Or do some work while you're in the car. Self-driving cars, they can, it can tell you uh, uh, exactly, w w uh, you know, when an accident happens, it can have a record of exactly what happened, right? So that could impact things. And think about one example maybe before I move on, maybe two examples, but the insurance. So in the old day that we're familiar with, like home insurance, house insurance, right? Remember the claims adjuster? You all have ever dealt with the adjuster? When there was, say, let's say, a hurricane? Hurricane happens, let's say a tree fell on your roof or something, right? They come in or something fell on your car. They come in and they evaluate, they check all the damage, and then, you know, they listen to your story or what happened. You tell them, oh, my TV got messed up. Now, you know there's a lot of fraud, unfortunately, in this situation, right? The, 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 maybe maybe the, the hurricane came and maybe it, it hit the, the, the window, but maybe they wanted a brand new television set. So what did they do? They said, oh, yeah, it hit the TV as well, so I'm going to need a new television, right? That happens. Right? We're, we're aware of that. That's why they have someone come in and check these things out. So you have systems now with the Internet of Things where, first of all, the temperature is monitored, the weather is monitored, your devices are monitored. So basically you're creating this system where it will be very difficult to game the insurance companies. Right? If, uh, so there's a lot of things that can happen. And the benefit also for, for the consumer is that, you know, then maybe the prices will go down, the rates will go down. But, so this is just a, a, a window into what can happen. And I'll have one last example before we get into the rest of this. There's something that is developing in technology called smart contracts. This is a smart contract. And it's so very interesting. Before we started here, before we started the, 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 the Juma, this session, I noticed that the Quran, which was, the Quran which was recited was, I believe it was the longest verse in the Quran. And, and you know it deals with contracts and business. You know, the longest verse deals with business contracts. The longest verse in the Quran. So what are they developing now? They're um, developing, there's a lot of talk about this, the idea of this technology and I won't get too technical, but there's something called blockchain technology. And people are referencing it in the way that you could have talked about the internet in the early 90s. Where basically this is a technology that people don't know really, the masses don't know what it is, 
But if you study it and you look at it, it's, it may change the world in the same way that the internet changed business, changed commerce, changed government, all these different things. So smart contracts with this technology, there's this idea that you could have records, birth records, death certificate records, all records that usually are difficult to verify on this technology. And there's, again, I don't want to get technical. The benefit of the technology is that it, it's, it's difficult to do fraud. It's difficult to fake anything, right? Because if you have this system, it can tell you exactly uh, in a very confirmed way uh, uh, what that transaction is or who owns this property, right? It keeps a very clear record. So there's talk about creating a smart contract where, for example, let's say you have your will. And in your will, usually, you have, when you die, first they verify that you're deceased, then they call the lawyer, they call these different people, they see who's getting what, and then, you know, they have several weeks go by, and then they parcel out the, 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 your, your estate, all your assets. Well, in a nutshell, the smart contract is this idea that there will be no room, there won't even be need for the lawyer. The technology is built so that it's so clear that when one thing is confirmed, that there was a death, and it's verified, that death certificate based on a lot of different things, you have died. Well, you've built a smart contract so that the technology allows all of the things to go into place. So that, boom, when it, that death certificate is confirmed, the assets transfer, and there's no doubt. You don't even need a bank that, go, that, that is the intermediary. The asset ownership transfers to whoever you have stipulated in your smart contract. It happens automatically. I know it sounds kind of far-fetched. It sounds... But... Again, maybe this specific thing won't be on a big scale, but things like this are happening. And then it relates to how it could connect to devices and the Internet. So, does this maybe sound scary? <laughs> you know, when you talk about these things, this Internet of things, this almost big computer, what's, the, what's what most of us are thinking, of, thinking about, right? So you're from a certain generation, you're probably thinking about Skynet right now, from the Terminator movies. Or you're probably thinking about the Matrix, right? Doesn't this some of that what sounds? This is some of what this sounds like this science fiction where where this technology just gets out of hand. That's what we're thinking. I know it because I think about that. But let's think about the two skiers, and let's think about what science fiction really is, right? Technology is just imagination, really. Technology is imagination. You figuring out how to do something, hopefully more efficiency, efficiently, using your imagination. But imagination or technology without, I'd say, a faithful orientation could lead to disaster. Right? I think that's what we're, a lot of us are concerned about. And so that is probably why in, some of, in science fiction movies you have apocalyptic endings, right? Because people are envisioning this world where there's all this technological advancement, there's all this imagination of what humankind could do, and there's no context for, for God, for Allah. There's no sort of moral context for it, usually in science fiction movies and books. So the person who looks at this is going to maybe quickly think, well, this could just be, this is going to be disaster. Because there's nothing, uh, you know, there, there's, there's not, there's, it's ruining, um, there's this potential for ruin. But think about the skiers. So when we think about this Internet of Things, there are some reference points that should come up. When you think about the Internet of Things, for the person familiar with the message of the Quran, one of the things that should pop up is Tawheed. Human beings, humankind, what have we been doing for thousands of years except patterning making patterns and developing technology based on what we see from God's truth. Sometimes whether we know it or not. So sometimes we're observing, right? What do we do? We observe the bird. So thousands of years, uh, no, a uh, hundred some years ago, someone would have said, yeah, hum humans can't fly, are not made to fly. Right? But we studied God's handiwork. And we do it in so many ways, so many things that sometimes happen naturally. And we can reflect on them and see that we're reflecting something that God has created in the world. So, if we think about the Internet of Things, 
we should be thinking about our reference point. And that's why, why I read that the, the hadith earlier about the prophet talking about the earth will disclose its news, right? And I didn't, I think I read it in English, but يَوْمَ إِذِينَ تُهَدِيثُ أَقْبَارَهَا That day, she will disclose her news. Akbaraha is, is a term for news or for tidings. And that term comes from the same root of, of uh, the root is khabara, right? Which is to know something, but it implies experience. It, it implies being very acquainted uh, uh, with it. And we know that Allah has, is the all-knowing. So, when we read that verse in the Qur'an, what might the doubting person say? They might say, oh, poppycock, you know, about you'll know an atom's weight of good or an atom's weight of bad, that the earth will reveal its news. It will reveal what is known. The person with the wrong reference point might say, ah, poppycock. But then what do I do as a believer? I look at my phone. I look at my Fitbit. I look at my Apple Watch. I don't have one, but if I did, I'd look at my Apple Watch. My, my browser history. My Netflix, which, which, which um, tells me what movies I've watched and maybe what movies I'm interested in. I look at all these things, and it shows me this, this characteristic of it seems like everything is being tracked. Well, isn't everything being tracked from a believer's perspective? So, don't get it mixed up, right? This is not, you know, this is the privacy concerns that, are, that, that we have about uh, issues of surveillance and issues of uh, privacy in the internet. I'm not, I'm not downplaying those. But I'm just saying we have to remember our reference points. When we hear about these things, when we're learning about these things, it should call to mind Tawheed. Because it's clear. Now we have the evidence. Now if the, the Quran told us that, no, that the earth is going to reveal and disclose everything that has happened, whether it was good or bad. Now the Quran told us that 1,400 years ago. Now maybe people didn't believe it. Guess what? Now technology is proving it. That technology is an example. It is pointing us to the truth of the Qur'an. How about that? How is that for a perspective for how the believer should see this, technology, this technological advancement? The technology is showing us what the Qur'an has already said is. So it's not just the Internet of Things. But maybe this can go in hand if we use our imagination as, as Muslims. Maybe this could actually go in hand in hand with taqwa. Maybe it's not the Internet of Things. Maybe it's the Internet of taqwa, right? Or the Internet of, of Tawheed, because you'll see it the way they write it, IOT, Internet of Things. So I would say that the scientific revolution is happening. The question is, how does the believer relate to it? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillahi Rahman Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Allahumma salli ala Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim inaka hamidun majid Allahumma barak ala Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim inaka hamidun majid So to, to wrap this up Allah says elsewhere in the Quran أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدرك الأبصار وهو اللطيف القبير صلّى الله عليه So Allah says, no vision can grasp him. But his grasp is over all vision. He is above all comprehension, aware of all things. So these words, I think, 
can give us some context, the right context for all this grandeur that we're seeing and for all these things, which honestly, yes, I'll admit, can be a little, from, from us, you know, for our, uh, our understanding, can be a little uh, scary or we, we, we can be skeptical about. Uh, but this can give us context because as much as we develop when we talk about the Internet of Things, as much as it seems like we're, there's all this vision of things that are, are tracking and seeing and your heart rate is getting monitored and all these things are happening under the sun, right? But we have to keep in mind that Allah is over that vision. Allahu Akbar. Allah is bigger. So even when we see all this stuff, right? Which is, that's why people are getting, people are worried and concerned. It does seem so consuming. If you have a small idea of, of God, Right? If you think of God in a small way, when you see all this exquisite stuff, it, it, it's just too much. But if you have this sense of Allah is bigger, there's nothing that the human being could create. There's nothing that could be um, uh, crafted or constructed that will take away from the grandeur of Allah. So his vision is over all things. Whether we have satellites and telescopes that are seen far into other planets and galaxies, Allah encompasses all of that. And we shouldn't get into this trap, because remember, if even unfortunately, remember I talked about the scientific revolution that happened in the centuries uh, um, after the Prophet, but we know, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but we know afterwards, in more recent years, there were Muslims, communities, and, 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 and kingdoms who became very skeptical with scientific advancement. And often thought it was, was, was wrong to see things like radios and TVs. And when, the, when this stuff was first happening, what were the, what were the Muslims, how were, how were they dealing with it? It wasn't always uh, embracing it. It wasn't always participating in it. A lot of times it was very skeptical about technology. And we don't want to fall into that trap. So in that verse we just read, it says, Allah is al-latif al-kabir. Right? And al-kabir, remember, qabara. And al-latif, subtle, you know. Allah is aware of the most, the tiniest, most minuscule things, the delicate and the fine latif, which means that nothing is hidden from him. And he is al-kabir, right? He is, he is aware, he, is, oh, he knows of, of things, and this is this this knowledge, right? Decla- declaring the news, the uh, akbaraha, right? The the news, the the information that is experienced. Allah is familiar with that. His vision is over all of this. So that's the one thing we can take comfort in. A lot of these ap- uh, apocalyptic science fiction movies, or one, the one of the reasons why they're so dreary, is because they're showing the damage of technology, but. But God is empty. God is not there. There's no, there's no idea of God being in existence in most science fiction movies. So that's what's missing. We don't have to fall into the same perspective of the person who sees God in a small way. We should have, I'd say, a bigger perspective. And to end on some recent news, and then I'm going to mention um, something I think you, you, you will get a Kick, uh, kick out of. So the name Scott Kelly is probably familiar to some of you. Scott Kelly is a NASA astronaut. Last week he just completed, he was the first human being to complete a year in space. I mean, this is, we're talking, this is like all the milestones of, you know, if space milestones of Yuri Gagarin, the first man to go into space, uh, John Glenn, the first man to orbit, Neil Armstrong, the first man to step on the moon, right? And Scott Kelly, the first human being to spend a continuous year, 365 days, in outer space. He was on it on Instagram, on Twitter. He took pictures in this International Space Station. He just returned. And what does this mean? This probably means that maybe the moon, maybe Mars is next. This is going to happen. These things that we didn't think that were science fiction to us, they have all, people have already signed up to be on Mars. The people who are going to be on Mars, inshallah, are alive today. They're already alive. So this is the world that we're walking into. 
So this is a scientific revolution that's happening. And what is the world that it's going to create? We have to think about our imagination. So the scientific revolution of centuries ago, it actually helped society, right? It wasn't an apocalypse because it was imagination. It was technology filled with faith. And we can think of things in a similar way. And I'll end on an interesting note, which is a film that came out over uh, 15 or 16 years ago. And it's not a very good film, and I only bring it up because it's a unique film that I think we could learn from. And it's a film called Pitch Black. It's a science action adventure with Vin Diesel. And it came out, I think, in the year 2000. So why did I bring up Pitch Black? This was... This was, again, not the best movie. It's not going to win any Oscars. But the movie is basically about some people far into the future. They're sort of castaways on a ship. The ship lands on this planet, and then they have to survive, and there are monsters on the planet. Typical science fiction stuff. But what was the interesting thing about this movie? It's one of the few science fiction movies I've seen that had Muslim characters. So there's a man on the, the ship who lands on the planet named, they just call him Imam. That's his name. They don't give him a name. But he's with some other people, Hassan, Suleiman. And there's a whole story behind him, but they're, they're praying. They're, when they land, they're on, they land on this planet, there's no water, so they make Tayyamun in the sand. They're, they're thinking about praying. The people, they don't have any water. They find this uh, crate, and it has all this alcohol. They say they can't drink. They, they can't drink the alcohol. I mean, they're, they're Muslim. They're practicing Muslims in the future. Now, there's some stuff that's kind of, you know, far out there. That, you know, but it, it's, just, it's science fiction. They're, they're going to New Mecca. I mean, you know, it's not, you know, again, it's science fiction. But it poses some interesting questions. And the thing that is interesting about the film, the Muslims in this story provide the moral compass for the movie. And I'm not going to do any spoilers. I won't give away the whole movie in case you see it. But I'll just say, they show different mindsets. They show someone who declares themselves to be an atheist and don't believe in God. They show people who maybe, you know, have no, or maybe on the fence. But they show what happens through the movie. And even though the Muslim characters, they're not the stars, but they're prominent. And they provide a moral campus. And towards the end of the movie, faith and prayer remain intact. This was great. This was, so this is a great, this is the type of thing we should, you know, we, we should be reflecting on. So let us think about how life is advancing. We can embrace technology. We just have, we need to have the right orientation. So we shouldn't have imagination without faith. Faith is what, what anchors us. So perhaps we proceed cautiously, but the Internet of Things is here. It is happening. We don't have to throw out babies with bath, bath water, right? But from the faith perspective, from the Quranic perspective, what this Internet of Things shows us is an Internet of Taqwa and of Tawheed, if we think about it in the right way. So alhamdulillah, anything which I have said which has been good in this khutbah is due to, due to God, and I give thanks uh, and praise to Him. Anything which was bad or an error, I seek refuge with Allah from from falling into 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 error. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen for coming to Salah. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu an Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Hayya al-Salah, hayya al-Salah. Kad Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Good, pretty ready. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah, he robbed the Alameen. Our Rahman, your Rahim. Maliki Yawm al-Din 
إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو المالك القدوس سبحان الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم نشرح لك صدرك ووضعنا أنك وزرك الذي أنقد ذهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإن مع العسر يسرا إن مع العسر يسرا فإذا فرت فانسب وإلى ربك فارغب الله أكبر سامي الله لمن حمدا الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نمت إليهم غير المغضوب إليهم ولا الضالين قل هو الله أحد الله السمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سامي الله لمن حمدا الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Assalamualaikum. That's right. Allahu Akbar. Really thank our brother Yahya Fanusi. You think big. If you if you think small, you do small things. You think big, you should be doing big things. So Allah gives us Allahu Akbar so we can reach and see the bigger things. Uh, before we bring the announcements, I just want to mention uh, two announcements that may not be in the announcements today. 
Uh, one is that's going to be a contest, a reading contest, uh, to read the book on Muhammad the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they're giving out 99 awards uh, in 33s. Uh, 33 awards, you get a free trip, uh, Umrah. Second one, you would get an iPad, an Apple iPad. Uh, 33 of you receive received that award. And then 33 will receive a, a gift card, a $100 gift card for Amazon. And all you have to do is read the book, and there's a contest, and you go online and ask the multiple course, uh, choice questions about what you read in the book. And, uh, of course, the winners are determined based on those answers. And, again, the book is Muhammad, the Messenger of God. We do have the books downstairs in the bookstore. The contest starts April the 16th, and it ends April the 20th. That's when you would have had to go on online and, and fill out the multiple choice questions to get in line up to receive one of those uh, 99 uh, awards. Uh, so that's going on now. You can go also go online, I believe, to register as well. This is a contest being organized by the Path of the Prophet Foundation. Path of the Prophet Foundation is organizing this uh, contest. The other thing is we do have tickets now on sale. He's going to mention the, the NACM uh, conference and also the comedy show. Tickets are on sale now. Uh, the $40 tickets are on sale for $30. Uh, the uh, $50 tickets are on sale, I think, for $10 less as well. And the, let's see, let's see if I have that. The $35 is on sale for $25. That's for the breakfast. So the conference tickets, uh, then they have the comedy show tickets. Then obviously there's premium seating for $100. Those don't seem to be a discount on those. Uh, but they're on sale now, so you can get them. That's only going to be a limited time and a limited amount of tickets. Uh, so try to get your tickets uh, for the NACIM conference. Uh, and this year's focus is going to be on business, and of course we hear a lot about business and technology, et cetera, but this is this year's conference uh, focus. Uh, so I'll turn the rest over to uh, uh, Brother Lyndon for the uh, core announcement. Assalamu alaikum. I'm going to try to be real quick so we can uh, do what we're supposed to do according to the Quran, get back in the business. Uh, tomorrow, Saturday, at 10 a.m., there'll be intermediate Quranic Arabic class at 1505 4th Street. At, uh, tomorrow at the America's Islamic Heritage Museum, 2315 uh, Martin Luther King Avenue Southeast, we have the grandson of Booker T. Washington doing a book signing starting at 12. I believe that's going to be a luncheon as well at 1 and uh, also uh, my son has a book called Kalaloo and they got a second book out and they're going to be part of that presentation as well. Salim Abdul Mateen is the point of contact if you have any questions or want to RSVP for the luncheon. On Sunday, 9 a.m., Ash-Shahada 101 course, Islamic Studies here in the Musala, as well as the Youth Weekend Program from 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. And there's a Board of Advisors meeting going on at 10 a.m. As well as basic Quranic Arabic class on Sunday from 11 to 12.30. At 11.30 a.m. you can call in to the Study Al-Islam uh, class where we have scholars who are uh, very well versed in the tafsir of Imam W.D. Muhammad and the Quran and the life example of Muhammad the Prophet that you can listen to for 30 minutes every Sunday. From 2 to 4 p.m. we invite all members and non-members, anyone who would like to be a part of this Muslim Christian encounter called Concept of a Merciful God right down the street at Redeemer Catholic Church. We hope we get a good showing from our community there. Imam Talib Sharif will be one of the presenters uh, given the Muslim perspective on the concept of a merciful God. The key bar, that's the senior halal feeding prog uh, program every uh, day, the only one in the city, the only one in the country. And it's a correction that on Wednesday, March the 16th, from 2 to 4 p.m., not Thursday. They want all to enjoy good food, good company, good music, and fun for the spring pre-spring flame. When the Washington Interfaith Network are having a hearing on a bill 21620, which is to shut down D.C. General Family Shelter, it will be held 
at the John Wilson Building, 1350 Pennsylvania Avenue, on Thursday, March the 17th, 2016. And as you already know, or should know, that Mesjid Muhammad is a founding member of the Washington Interfaith Network, and they are doing a lot of good things. The share food distribution will take place Saturday, March the 19th at 7 a.m. here in the social hall. And this is the last one. Well, no, I got a few more on the other side. Marvel Post One, but this one is dear to me. Get your Muslim journal, and you can read about the uh, event I, I attended in Boston, Massachusetts a few weeks ago, as well as uh, Saturday, March the 19th, at Masjid Muhammad at 9 a.m. We are encouraging and inviting all veterans to be here for a breakfast and an emergency meeting because we need to get post one, the founding post of our, our uh, fledgling organization back on track. So we need all veterans to come out and support that. And that's uh, Saturday, March the 19th at 9 a.m. And Body Spirit Workshop taking place. And this is taking place at the YMCA Anthony Bowen Branch, 1325 West W Street, North, on Saturday, March the 19th at 1 p.m. So that's next Saturday at 1 p.m. Contact Aliyah Aleem, and we have an email for her if you need to get in contact with her. Master Muhammad Recreation Hiking Day Trip, the following Saturday, March the 26th, save the date. And Sisters Saturday meeting will be held April the 2nd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So if you're a sister in this community, the sisters got some big plans, doing some big things. They're bonding, and it says they're doing some shopping too. So I don't know what, well, I guess I can use my imagination on that one. But there's vending. If the sisters want to vend, I don't think they charge you for vending at this because they're really trying to unite the sisters because, you know, uh, we can't go no further than, than, than uh, our sisters, you know, will uh, help us go and be a part of that. And Imam Sharif mentioned the Nasim conference that's taking place April the 8th through the 10th. That's a big event, our fourth annual. They have a tent out front. Get your tickets and all the information you need from them. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.